Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. I'm glad to see so many here on this wonderful day. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, both spiritual and physical. Uh, you're a gift to your families, you're a gift to the church, and you're a gift to the community. Speaking of community, someone uh, left this on my pulpit. The census coming up. Uh, please partake in the census. It helps your community. Uh, it also helps your church. So please, if you've not made arrangements to do that, please do so. Uh, also, we started Sunday School back today. Um, I've not heard any reports, so apparently it wasn't very good. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. Um, but no, we, we did start back Sunday school today, and I was happy to see uh, people return. There's a, something about returning back to Sunday school gives you a little more of that sense of normalcy, um, and that's a good thing, even in a socially distanced um, capacity. Uh, it was good to be together again on that. Uh, lastly, lastly, on July 5th, we will be taking communion. Uh, the way we're going to do it is going to be different because of the social distancing guidelines. It's going to be different. We're going to have, um, some of you may have seen them before, uh, the cups that are sealed with a wafer on top and sealed again. Uh, so you will have to peel um, to get the bread and then peel again to get the cup. So um, I know that for many is not ideal and you're kind of thinking that seems maybe a little awkward. Well, uh, we get to do it together and it's not about necessarily um, how awkward or the different things that we've got to do, but it's about uh, what it means and what it represents and what Christ has promised for us. And so uh, as the session and also the COVID committee discussed, it's much better to serve communion in this way temporarily so that we can share once again in the Lord's blessing together in the sacrament. Uh, it's much better to do it this way than to not do it for the foreseeable future since we don't know what the future holds with our guidelines. So uh, let us all uh, begin now preparing ourselves for the Lord's Supper to come on July 5th. All right, before I proceed, are there any further announcements? Please stand with me for your call to worship. God has called you into his presence this morning from Psalm 135. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. Amen. Let's sing to him now by turning to him number 53. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. 53.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune God, the only God, the Lord God Almighty, Yahweh, our King, we come to you this morning asking, Lord, would you please forgive us of our many sins. We know that we cannot approach you without the blood of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, but he has made a way for us. He has made a way for us to come into the holy places and approach your throne with boldness and confidence, knowing that you, our Father, will not turn your ear from us, but will bend your sovereign ear to hear us. Lord, we ask as we draw near to you this morning, draw near to us in your spirit. Help us to be reminded and believe the promises purchased from your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to pray in faith the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. culture that's rapidly changing and it can be alarming at times it can be nerve-wracking but we take confidence that the truth of the Christian faith still remains true yesterday today and forever so I ask you Christian what is it that you believe I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. If you'll take your green Trinity hymnals and turn to page 786. You got it? <laughs> 786. Now, last week I actually said we'd be reading Psalm 3, but I told a small fib without uh, realizing it. Uh, they've done us a favor by taking out the imprecatory psalms. So instead of praying for God to destroy our enemies, we'll be reciting together Psalm 4. Follow along with me and read with me Psalm 4. Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, O oh men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. In your anger, do not sin. When you are on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for the truths that we have recited, the truths of the 
forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body and the Holy Spirit. Every Lord's Day, we are reminded of your grace and your truth and that you are God alone and you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because of that, we know your promises are not void, but only that much greater affirmed and fulfilled for us. Lord, you have given us greater joy, greater joy than when grain and wine wine abound, greater joy than that. Lord, help us to know that joy deeply. Help us to believe and know that you can satisfy us far above all things that we may ask for. You are able to do far greater than anything we ask, and so, Lord, we ask that you would fill our hearts with joy, the joy of our salvation, that you would guide the leaders of our country on every level, that you would give them wisdom to lead in this time of such distress and division and fear. Lord, would you help them to wield the sword of justice faithfully according to your law and fill them with wisdom that they may act according to your revealed will. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation and our loved ones who are sick and who struggle with various ailments and who may even be nearing the end. Lord, we ask that you would bring peace and comfort. And we do pray for their healing, but Lord, whatever you desire, your will be done. Help us as the church to gather around them and encourage them and love them well. Strengthen their families who may be tired and weary. May they come to you and find rest. Lord, we ask that you would bless the rest of our service. Help us to worship in spirit and truth. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 247. O sacred head now wounded, 247. be seated. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. We'll be looking at verses 14 to 23. It's 
It's on your pew Bible on page 66 in the New Testament, 66. As you're turning there, let me remind you that we spent a couple of weeks looking at uh, the doctrine of baptism. Uh, we mainly did a, an overview of the doctrine of baptism, um, which is good for us to do and to remind us of the promises. We decided to spend a few weeks looking at the baptism in the Lord's Supper, the sacraments that the Lord has given us, and today we begin discussing the Lord's Supper, and we're going to spend three weeks, including today, on the Lord's Supper, then on the third week we'll take it together, uh, which is wonderful, and so my hope is that these uh, next couple sermons uh, help prepare your heart, but also give you um, a, a level of excitement, and that you look forward to taking the Lord's Supper, and it also gives you an opportunity to Examine yourself, as the scripture calls us to do. Um, and so today we're going to be looking at f the foundations of the Lord's Supper, and then we'll build uh, doctrinally upon that starting next week. Um, let's read together, beginning in verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it could be who is going to do this. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our God stands forever. Well, this passage is about a meal. I love meals, as you can tell. I have to admit, moving to Alice Full, part of uh, the reason I moved here was because every time I came, I got fed so well, and uh, I had to compare with other churches, and I thought, well, who serves the best food? And y'all won out. No, but it's part of our culture, isn't it, as Americans and especially as Southerners. Um, it's our culture to enjoy good meals. Some of our best moments in our life has been joy, have been, uh, we've enjoyed them around a dinner table with family and friends and loved ones. Some of the moments that are most etched into our memory are those of uh, good meals that we've shared and spe on special occasions. You know, sometimes, though, the meal is actually fairly normal. It's average. It's things that we've had over and over again, but there's something about the occasion that makes it special. And even more, there's something about the company that we share which makes it special. You can eat spaghetti on your own every day if you want. But have a friend that you haven't seen in years or a loved one who's come back from a trip, and all of a sudden that spaghetti becomes a great meal, special. Did you do something different with this sauce? No, it's the same old recipe I've always had. Something about it, it's just so good. Well, it was the company that made it so good. I remember when I, uh, my wife and I got married, the first thing we did, we didn't get to eat at the, at the uh, uh, wedding reception because it was such a hustle and bustle situation and we left and the first thing we did was we called in uh, to go food from a local diner in Chattanooga that we loved. Uh, that was the first thing we did. We were in the car and I picked up the phone. We were starving. This diner's pretty good. I've eaten there a bunch and all I had was chicken fingers. I remember that meal. I remember that meal because that's the first meal that I had as a husband. 
That's the first official meal that we had together, and it was special, and it was one that I will not forget. It's the company and the occasion that make the meal go from ordinary to excellent. Well, this meal is that we're about to talk about is far greater and far more special, and the company is far better. We're going to look first at the occasion for this meal. The occasion for this meal. Why were they there? Why tonight? Why on this night did they have this meal? Why did Jesus specifically call them to the upper room to eat with him? Well, it was Passover. It was perhaps the most well-recognized, even to this day, Jewish holiday. This was a national holiday for them. Passover had special significance. And if you remember the, the very first Passover in Exodus chapter 12, you'll remember that uh, here they are, God's people have been in bondage to Egypt and slavery for decades and decades and years and years and generation after generation. They've been in bondage. They enjoyed wealth and prosperity. And if you remember the uh, end of Joseph, they, they, Joseph uh, helps them enjoy this wealth and prosperity. That's what they had become accustomed to. God had been blessing them, and they used Joseph to bless them. This was God's people. He loved them. He took care of them, and yet there arose one in Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he enslaved God's people. More brick, less straw. That's not good enough. They never knew a day that, of freedom. They didn't know what it was like, and they longed for it. And God comes to them in Exodus 3 and in Exodus 6 and promises them. He gives them sure promises. I will deliver you out of the hands of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Honey, I will be your God, and you will be my people. If you'll remember the past two weeks when we talked about baptism, that's exactly what God says to us in baptism, I will be your God and you will be my people. So God has promised them in the Passover, I will protect you, I will love you, I will bring you to the land. You will be my people. I will cherish you, the apple of my eye. He promised that to them. And he delivered. And the night before they were to leave Egypt, they took this Passover meal where they slaughtered a lamb and took the blood and put it on the lintel and the doorposts. And as God sent the angel of death, he would pass over all the houses and all the land that had the blood on the doorposts. And anyone who didn't suffered the righteous judgment of God as he smote the firstborn son in each household. And so they ate this Passover meal being, they were looking forward to the coming moment of their salvation, the coming fulfillment of God's promises. But they didn't just do it once. Passover was taken every year until today even. Passover still goes on. They still eat for this ritual and still eat for this reason. And if you think about this, let's say two generations after the Exodus, they're still eating this bread, and you see it in the book of Deuteronomy. He gives them, again, instructions on the Passover and reminds them of what he had done for them in Egypt. They were reminded. And in Deuteronomy, they say, once you've uh, sla slaughtered the lamb and you've eaten and you pass around the bread of affliction, the bread of affliction that is a sign that I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I was faithful to your fathers and I'll be faithful to you. Every time for generation after generation, they reminisced of God and his atoning work that he had done for them. So this occasion was special. It was a special and holy day for them. But yet it was far more special because of point number two, the company. 
the company who was there. This wasn't just any run of the meal Passover. This was, this was special. It was unique. It was different. It was filled with emotion. You could feel it in the air. All of Jesus' life was leading to this moment. He was to head to the cross and he knew it. He knew it from a young age when the Spirit revealed the truth of the Scriptures to him. Learning in the temple as a young boy, growing in favor and stature with God and man. Knowing that one day he was going to head to the cross to pay for the sins of God's people. To make a perfect, atoning sacrifice. Can you imagine the anxiety, the anticipation? He had told them this day was coming. And you'll remember, Peter's not one to back down from a fight. We see that a couple times in Scripture. And every time Jesus would say, I must die. I must go. I must leave. My life must be taken. Every time he would say that, Peter would say, not on my watch, Lord. No, 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 no. I'll die. I'd rather die than betray you. And Jesus knows exactly what Peter's going to do when it comes time to stand up for Christ. Peter runs. But this company, this Lord, this host of the meal, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who hosts the meal, with that on his mind, with that coming in just a matter of hours with the reality of the crucifixion, the reality of a brutal death by Roman soldiers being betrayed by your loved ones, knowing that the very ones he shared the table with, knowing that they were to all leave him, Judas turned him in. Peter denied him to a little girl. The rest of the disciples fled. He knew that. He knew that was coming. In fact, if you were to drop down to verse 31, he affirms that he knows that and says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. By the way, as a side note, that's a wonderful scripture. Are you weak in faith this morning? Jesus has prayed for you that your faith would not fail. You can read in John 17 about that. And when you have turned again, he says, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Jesus knew that one of his closest and most trustworthy disciples who said, I will go to prison or the grave for you, he knew that Peter was going to turn and run when the going got tough. And yet, look at what, look at what our host, our Savior, look at what he says. Don't skip over this. Verse 15, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. What love and what grand work what amazing grace this is. That Jesus, knowing all those things, knowing his death was impending, knowing he'd die alone, naked on a cross, knowing that was going to happen, knowing that the Father would turn his back on him, knowing that just as we pronounce a benediction of God's blessing on his people, that he was going to be have God's curses renounced on him, knowing those things, and yet he says to his loved ones, I have desired to eat this meal with you. All of life is building up to this moment. I have desired to sit and eat this meal with you. Do you know, my friends, how much Jesus loves you? He has desired to eat this meal with you. He knows. He knows your faith is weak. He knows that you will turn away. He knows that you'll have to be restored again. He knows the sins that you've committed in your heart that no one else knows about. He knows those things and went to the cross knowing that and saying, I'll pay for that, that they're mine. 
I'll pay for those sins. What great love is this? And he says, I have desired to earnestly eat this meal with you. I have desired to be with you. I've, been, I've desired to serve you in this way. You know, in the ancient cultures, and you can read back in the Old Testament especially about this, and Jesus actually uses a parable uh, and uses this as an example, but in ancient times, it was the greater, the one with the more respect, the higher status. It was the greater person who sat and reclined at the table while the lesser in the house came to serve the greater. That was how it worked, and it's somewhat still the same today. But the lesser in the household would come and serve the greater, and yet we see that reversed here. It is the greatest serving the least. And he says, I have desired to do this for you. The host is part of the company. And what else is part of the company? We've kind of touched on it. It's his people. It's those who have outwardly professed faith in Christ. Now, of course, we know that one is the son of the devil. But up until this time, he has professed faith in the Lord and has done the Lord's work. And so it is often with our church body. So often we sit in the pew with people who have professed faith in Christ, but they don't really know him. It's those who've professed faith in Christ that are now around the table, those he has chosen to eat with. Could you imagine sitting there at that table at that moment if you're a disciple? And Jesus has been foretelling all these things. This is the last meal you're going to have with him. That's what he's saying. And you don't want to believe it. And you love him so much, and he loves you. And this is that last moment. Do you remember the last meal you had with someone? Oh, would you that you could go back and have it again a hundred times over? No doubt that's what they had, the occasion, Passover, the company of Jesus and his people, his people who are united. They're united at the table for the time being. They're together. And lastly, and this will be the largest point, the food. Now, what's a meal without food? Now, it would be enough. It would be enough for Jesus to gather them around and say, I just want to hang out for a few minutes. My time's coming, and I just want to relax. I want to take a breather. I want to pray together. I want to do what we used to do one last time. I want to have this one last moment with you and enjoy it. And no, he gives them food. And he says, let's eat together. You know, it's amazing. Meals actually play a large role in Scripture and in the Christian life. If you were to fast forward to uh, Jesus on the beach of Galilee after his resurrection, when he's, uh, before he ascends into heaven, he is on the beach and they don't recognize him. For whatever reason, they don't recognize him. They spend all that time with him and Maybe he looked slightly different. Maybe they uh, were clouded with unbelief. Who knows? Maybe they just thought they'd never see him again, and it couldn't possibly be him. And what does he do? You remember what he does when he gets them on the beach and they finally realize who it is? Remember what he says to them? Let's have a fish fry. They do. They go and cook food. They go and cook fish that they caught on the beach. Let's go have a fish fry. There's something unique about this, something unique about <clears throat> the meal. But yet, in this meal, it's normal food. It's a normal Passover. In Passover, there were four cups. And if you look at the words of institution here, he gives them the cup, verse 17, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. And then later on, after he gives the bread... He gives them another cup and says, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's two different cups. Now you think, well, wait a minute. In the Lord's Supper, we don't use two cups. You're right. 
the first cup that's mentioned there is probably one of the four cups, maybe the second or third, of the Passover. That was a common cup, and he gave it, gave thanks for it. But they enjoyed bread and wine. What's so special about bread and wine? You know, it's actually mentioned a couple of times in Scripture. If you read Psalm uh, 104, 15, and in fact, we'll, I'll turn there. Psalm 104, 15 actually tells us it's, it's intentional that Jesus chose bread and wine for this sacrament. 104, 15 Actually, I'll begin reading in verse 14. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth. Verse 15, and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen the heart. Wine, a gift from the Lord to gladden the heart of man. Bread, a gift from the Lord to strengthen you. And we know that. You know that. When you get out of here, especially because your preacher's long-winded, you think, if he doesn't wrap this up, I'm going to starve to death. And you go home and you eat, or you go to Jack's, and you eat, and you immediately feel better. You don't have the shakes anymore. Your knees aren't weak anymore. You feel strong. You feel strengthened. Or you feel really tired. But you have this strength about you that you didn't have before. You had sustenance. And so Jesus gives them this bread and this wine, something that was a gift for them to make them glad. It was for their enjoyment. He wants you to enjoy the food. They weren't going to look at this and go, oh, goodness, this old meal again. No, it was a, it was a meal of enjoyment. He could have chosen anything. He could have chosen anything in his sovereign providence. He could have given the Passover any number of foods back in Exodus, but he didn't. He chose this one and said it's to strengthen you and bring you joy. That physical food matters, but it's just normal food. Nothing special takes place when we have the supper, when I administer the supper in a couple of weeks and I recite this passage. And you take the bread and you take the cup, there's, it doesn't change into anything. It doesn't actually change. It's still just bread and a cup. But there's something special about it. This isn't just a physical meal this is a spiritual meal. This is spiritual food. This is spiritual drink. This is soul food. This is food that nourishes your soul. Imagine, if you will, you're one of these disciples. And you've got this bread and this wine for your enjoyment and pleasure and for your strength. And then Jesus goes to the cross and you're heartbroken, and you're scared. And he's raised from the dead. He ascends at the right hand of God and sends his Holy Spirit, which is a wonderful gift. It's a down payment of our inheritance. But you're still, you miss him. You miss being with him. You miss sharing this meal with him. Maybe your faith begins to struggle because you once had Jesus there in front of you, and now, he's not in front of you. You seem almost left alone. You know, in Acts 2.42, it says that the early church devoted themselves to the, breaking, to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Jesus says, this is my body given for you. This is bread is broken for you. Can you imagine every time they took the supper, every time that cup was passed to them, every time they took that bread, you know they thought about that moment. You know they thought about the Father and His love in sending the Son 
and the Son's love and sending the Spirit, you know that they were reminded of what Jesus had done for them. Passover had now taken on a new meaning for them. No longer were they looking back at the exodus of leaving Egypt. Now they were looking at the new exodus. The new exodus has come. Jesus has led his people out of bondage and slavery and into the land that one day we will have in the new heavens and new earth. Jesus has ushered in his kingdom. And every time they took just simple bread and wine and set it aside for holy use. And that's the difference. It was set aside here for holy use. And every time they did, you know they thought about how great of love does he have for us. Do you remember what he did? He knew we were going to betray him. We knew He knew we were going to fail. He knew that. And continued on. And gave us this meal. And now we take of this meal often. And why do we take of it often? Because of what he's done for us. Because we need to be reminded there's no, and we'll talk about this more next week, there's no special grace that comes with the Lord's Supper that you don't get in the Word or in baptism. But it's a confirming grace. It confirms to you what you've heard in God's Word. It confirms the preaching to you. This morning I have proclaimed to you the love of Christ for sinners, for you, dying on the cross for you. Knowing how much of a train wreck you are, I've proclaimed that to you. And so, I'm going to do it again next week and the week after that, and God willing, for the rest of my days. I'm going to preach the gospel. And when we take the supper in a couple of weeks, when you take that bread and that cup, you will be reminded, you'll be confirmed, you'll be strengthened. I've heard the word preached. I know the gospel to be true, but I'm weak and I'm failing. And Jesus says, take this it's for your strength. It's for your health. It's for your enjoyment. It's the gospel to your taste buds. You see and feel baptism. You hear the word preached. And you taste of the goodness and gifts of God in the supper. You take it and you're reminded of His goodness and you're strengthened and you're confirmed. And that's precisely what Jesus wants to do for them here. It points to what was coming. His substitutionary death. No longer were lambs needed to sacrifice and spread blood on the door. No longer was that needed. No longer was an altar needed for sacrifices. No longer is the altar a sign for God's people. That's why we don't have an altar here. We don't need an altar. We don't need to make more sacrifices. We don't need to pay for our sins. It's already been done, and so we have a table. And so instead of God calling you to make atonement for your sins by slaughtering a lamb, He calls you to a table and fellowship with Him and says, Come, take and eat. The sacrifice has already been done. The new exodus has come. The new Passover has come. It's all been fulfilled. And every time we take the supper, it points to that. And we're reminded of that, but it also points to something else. It points us to eternity. Look at Jesus' words here where he says, in verse 16, For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He's pointing them not only to his work on the cross, but he's pointing them to the fulfillment of the kingdom. The kingdom is now, it's broken in with Jesus. The kingdom has broken in, and it's taking over. And one day it will be fully consummated. The new heavens and new earth will come down. Crown him with many crowns. Every knee shall bow. You know what else Revelation says will happen? We will enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb, where one day we will feast with him again reclining at the Lord's table with the Lord once again, physically. We see Him face to face and we will be conformed perfectly to His image. One day we will see Him and we'll be transformed, renewed completely to be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. And He points them to that. 
One day the kingdom will be fulfilled and we will take of this cup again. We will fellowship with him again. And so right now we're given the supper now, almost as a, as a foretaste of things divine, a foretaste of things to come. Not only does it point back to, to Christ and his sacrifice and strengthen our faith that way, but it gets a, gives us hope for the coming marriage supper of the Lamb where one day God's people will dwell with God again with no barriers, no sins, no temple, just us and God in the new heavens and new earth. Is there better news than that? Is there anything better than that, my friends? Can you imagine what we'll say that day? When we see Jesus face to face, after our life of sin and weakness is over, you'll look and it'll be grand and glorious and beautiful and the table will be spread and the king will invite you not to serve him but to join him with all the heavenly hosts around. And you'll look at each other and you'll say, can you believe we made it here? Can you believe we're here? Can you believe this is for us? Can you believe it? How did I get here? And then someone will say, because Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but He washed me white as snow. The ways of the old covenant are gone. No need for an altar. No need for a sacrifice. The new covenant in His blood Verse 20, and likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. He signs and seals the benefits of the new covenant to you. This is my body. This is my blood. He's pointing to himself. This is what this represents. This is not a mere memorial. We do this in remembrance of him, and it's actually kind of convicting when you don't take the supper very, long, very often. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And how little do we remember him? How we ought to labor to remember him all the more. This is food for our souls. This is food for eternity. Ignatius, early church father, called this the medicine of immortality, the medicine of immortality. Life is long and sometimes the road is hard and our pilgrimage seems difficult. And we have many wounds and this is the medicine for immortality. This is where he meets and confirms and strengthens us by his spirit in the table. In a couple weeks when you take the supper, be reminded that it may be normal food, but the occasion and the company is what makes it. The Lord Jesus by His Spirit lifting our thoughts and our hearts heavenward, united with other believers around the table of the Lord Broken, train wreck sinners saved by grace. My friends, it's not just the average meal. It's a spiritual meal. It's soul food for me and you, pilgrims on the way. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we are humbled this morning. We are so humbled that you would lovingly condescend to us by way of covenant. And in that covenant, give us the medicine for immortality. To give us medicine for our many wounds and imperfections. How gracious it would have been for you to just give us only the preaching of your word. That would have been more than enough. But you have loved us so much and have 
recognized and know our weak frame, know that we need all the assurance that we can have and you have given that to us in your supper. Help us, Lord, to prepare our hearts accordingly to repent of sins that have not been repented of and to believe, Lord, the truth of 1 John, that those who confess their sins, you are faithful and just to forgive those sins. You have done it all. Give us that assurance, that blessing. May you remind us of that often. Help us throughout this week to be reminded of these truths. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing one last time hymn 498, Jesus, What a Friend for Sinners, 498. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes me whole. Amen. Receive your benediction. May the Lord, who gave his body and blood for sinners just like you and me, bless you and keep you now and forever. Amen.